Next topic, Brian Driscoll. We want yeah. to talk a little uh, college football. Yes, I you do. Know, wing around, right? I definitely do. I definitely yeah. do. I first want to talk about what in the heck is happening at Florida right now. Because I know you're a big Dan Mullen guy. I have expressed I, I mean, before, personally, I like Dan Mullen. Yeah. But, wow. You're talking about losing a team? He's lost that team. They gave up fit. They, they they were losing the entire game to Sam yes. Ferd. Sam. S-A-M. Sam Ferd. Yeah. yeah. That that's a that's a rough situation right there. It's Very. a real tough tough situation right there. Yeah. I mean they 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 pay teams like that to come to town. I mean from what I, I think they were I saw a three and tweet. five FCS team Vince. Yes. Yep. Yeah, right. They were paid over half a million dollars to come and play this game and presumably lose this game they did and they did eventually (laughs) they did and florida celebrated like they just won the national championship uh, you know what though you know what though i actually had so tell me your opinion of that vince because it sounds like you have some feelings on that i think it's i i as i get the fact that okay you you won and you didn't completely embarrass yourself although i feel like they did embarrass themselves as a team uh, in that game, I didn't like it. I, I didn't. I, I you should just be happy that you got out of there with a win. It's time to regroup and fix some stuff. Like I did not appreciate the big celebration. That's me. I, I, I I'm sympathetic to that. I feel like with how this season has gone for them, and with how that game started, you just fired your O line coach. You just fired your D coordinator. There were some some division in the locker room because of those coaches from before they were fired, which led to them being fired, according to some people I've talked to about it. Yeah. You've lost four of your previous five games. Your team needed to come together. You know, you needed something. And and I think it wasn't so much about beating Sanford as it was about this team just needed a win. This team – and, and I don't know I'm talking about a win on the football field – I'm talking about just an emotional win, just and a win I, in life. Just to, yeah, yeah. Just no, to, we can't, you know, it. it's we came together as a team and scored 35 points in the second half, and and won this game. And and I think it was more of a celebration of the week they had gotten through. I actually think that's something that could be a springboard for them emotionally. Now they have to. It, now if they come out this week and lay an egg uh, uh, against uh, Missouri. Then I'm going to say they were just acting like knuckleheads and it's an immature team. And, you know, but I'm curious to see how they respond to this because I, I do feel like part of me says, mate, this is something that, that it, that just looked like a team that had just had a big monkey, you know, like raced off their shoulder, you know, lifted off yeah. their back, you know, because of just, and not because of Sanford. It has nothing to do with Sanford. I, I really feel like the celebration wasn't about Sanford and, hey, we beat Sanford, but hey, guys you know, we've had a really rough week mm-hmm. and, and, and we could have quit and we could have gave up. And honestly, for a while we did. And they ba- rallied back and, and made plays and did what they needed to do. And, you know, I, I think, I think that's kind of where for me it came from because I mean, this, this team wasn't, yeah, I'm looking at it now. It was like they were down 42 to 28 at one point in time. And then Man. just, you know, I just, it was a, it was a, <laughs> It's a rough deal, man. man. And yeah. So so I understand where you're coming from, Vince. I just kind of felt like that really wasn't so much about Samford as it was about that how hey guys, we we came together and we did what we needed to do. But that was um but still though, the 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 point that they got to the the reason they got to that point to me is problematic for Dan Mullen. Oh yeah. Because he really has just not – he's just – he's not done what I thought. I thought that was an absolute grand slam home run hire. I, I, I did, and it's been – it's been rough. It's yeah. been really, really rough. Yes. Did you watch any of the Georgia-Tennessee game? I did not, no. I'm curious to see how – if you go back and watch it, I thought Tennessee moved the ball well early. By the middle of the second quarter, Tennessee was down their top three receivers Oof. and didn't do anything after that. Well, but yeah, they were moving I mean, early. But but I, I tell you, I was I liked how Georgia battled. I was impressed with how Georgia played. Their offense is still super vulnerable to me. It's not yeah. great. I'm curious how they're going to play against Alabama. But that was uh, interesting. There was at one point on Saturday, and I tweeted this out. 
it was it was Alabama, Florida, and who was the other team that was losing? Was it uh, Oklahoma? Maybe I forget Probably. who it was. I mean, they did lose. Yeah, so, but it was yeah. like three of those. I'd have to find the tweet, but like they were all losing, and I was just like, "This is kind of weird." It was a it was a really weird weekend. Did you watch the Michigan Penn State game? I swear, James Franklin, that freaking guy. I tell you what, man. I I did watch that game, and when he went for the fake field goal on fourth and two from the four-yard line and the manner in which they ran it and the execution of it, I mean, you want to talk about putting your kicker uh, in a precarious position and a potential opportunity to die, uh, that's what they did, and it was ugly. It was uh, First of all, I don't like the decision. I don't like the play call at all, well, no matter what the fake is, okay? But I, the execution of it, the the drawing up of it, the actual play itself, I thought was was terrible. They um, are a super finesse football team. Yeah, they are not on offense. They are not a physical offense. No, and that has surprised me. They are a pass happy, get it outside, not physical at the point of attack team. They can't run the ball at all. And and Michigan was down. They didn't have their you know Blake Corum didn't play, and they Michigan ran well on them. In my opinion, Hassan Haskins. I mean, Penn State should have won that game. It, 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 here's my question. No for question. You, here's the question that I wanted to to pose. At this point in time, is James Franklin more got to be more concerned with keeping his job at Penn State than he is the, taking getting another, another one? No, I'm serious about this. Yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to be flipping. This is what no, I, I know you're to, not. To, to and I'm curious what people think. Is listen. If if they play Rutgers this weekend at home, I assume they're going to win that one. I, I mean, then I they play so. at Michigan State. Okay, do you? Does anyone actually think that? Now again, at USC, they may do all types of dumb things. I just think their new AD is not an idiot. Hmm. Do you think they're going to hire a guy who just who, who's who's in the last two years has gone eleven and ten in two years of Penn? Think about that, because Penn State was four and five last year. True. You know, I mean, I. I I'm trying to figure out, like, and if he goes seven and five, a year after going four and five, is 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 the conversation more about how James Franklin needs to be on the hot seat as opposed to him getting a a a, a, a head coaching job at a bigger at a better better place? Well, he's he's staring two and five in the face to finish the season. Yeah, and that's that true. that's if they beat Rutgers, which I'm going to assume that they will. Yeah. And lose to to Michigan State. That's two and five to finish yeah. out the year. When right around that time that that losing streak started is right around the time USC fired their head coach, yeah. and your name became the top of the list. Right? Yeah. That's not <laughs> that's not a way to secure a job. And frankly, Penn State has has higher expectations than yes. what they've done the last two years. They have, and you know. We talk about, you know, when we were talking about conference realignment and all those different things and how Penn State, you know, they're their own entity and they were good when they were independent and all these other things and they don't really fit in the Big Ten. Well, you you have a brand all your own. You can't you can't be at this standard. This is not a Penn State standard, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think that that's fair when you're, when you're talking about mm-hmm. – the, the the fan base and you're talking about you know the alumni and all of those different things this is not the Penn State standard and I don't care how mm-hmm. well James Franklin is recruiting you can't finish the season two and five when you were it's even worse to be a when you're recruiting 15, well. top 10 team it's you even worse I mean? when you recruit yeah. the well he's way he's recruited exactly I mean exactly. they have what four starting offensive linemen coming back they got a three-year starter quarterback they got one of the best receivers in the country in Jahan Dotson you got a lot of guys coming back on I mean they're Everybody talked about how good Penn State was going to be this year. And I mean, Vince, again, they're 10 and nine in the last two years. 10 and nine. Yeah, that's not good. And, and so he's yeah, in so year eight. 10 and nine. And he's they're going to be eight. 11 and then two, you know, one more loss, right? So mm-hmm. 11 and 10 over two year span. And that's a guy that people are talking about getting an LSU USC job. Right. Based Talk on about what? Some slim pickings. <laughs> that's Based what, that's on what that tells what? me. I, I'm curious if if USC is seriously looking there. Very I, curious about that. Well, if if Notre Dame fans want James Franklin to have the USC job, which we all do, yes, me, okay, yes, you need to hope for a two and zero finish here for James Franklin. Yes, okay, and and look, as Notre Dame fans, period, for this season, you want 
them to beat Michigan State because hopefully that means Michigan State has lost their last two games of the season. They're mm-hmm. out because they would have lost to Ohio State and Penn State, so they're going to be out in front of you. And then you just hope that Ohio State takes care of Michigan and they're out. You know, all of those different, right? So Penn State still could throw a wrench into some things in the Big Ten and the college football playoff race. So mm-hmm. um, I personally want James Franklin to go 2-0 and so that he does end up going to USC. Mm-hmm. Because they'll look at that as a big win going to East Lansing and beating this Michigan State team, right? Mm-hmm. And that'll be what he's sitting on as his final regular season game, right. you know, because look, right. USC is going to hire him. They're going to hire him before the bowl game. Right. They're not going to wait till after the bowl game. No, they're going to do it. It's going to happen like about a week after the season's yes. over with hundred percent agree. Yes. A couple, couple comments real quick. Um, yeah. Matt D says, at least door has to kick the ball out of out <laughs> off, off out of bounds this season. You do know now, Matt, that he's going to do that this weekend against Georgia <laughs> Tech, and we're all blaming you this for is that. It's going to be your fault, Matt. It's going to be 100% your fault. Ooh, Although, I'm not going to lie, after watching Jameer Gibbs go, you know, take one back a hundo last week against Boston College, I would probably be happier with that than him to miss inbounds to Jameer Gibbs. Yeah. That would be uh, not good. We'll get back to college football here in a minute. Nicholas Grosh says, although, as mentioned, Kelly does have a lot of self-serving narratives, should the coaching staff get credit because the young players that have come in are basically ready? And that's what we said earlier. Yes. That's why he's – that's why he spit – that's why trying to hold on to this preseason narrative of, oh, we're young, is actually – this is the point we were making, Nicholas, and if we didn't make it clear, then that's on us, and I'm going to make it clear now. That's exactly what we were saying is – was – why it was annoying that he was still sticking to that we are a young team narrative because and trying to make it seem like they had a plan to get those young guys ready because they didn't really have a plan to get those young guys ready. But when you, but you know what, when they've had to play those young guys, those guys have stepped up and played. Now, part of that, in my opinion, is those guys came in ready to play to a degree, but you also have to coach them up. I mean, you don't see Logan Diggs making a bunch of assignment mistakes. That you know, Logan Diggs' footwork and his hurdling over guys and stiff arms. I don't give Lance Taylor any credit for that, just like I didn't give myself credit when my all American running back was doing those kind of things. Because as a running backs coach, that's you just letting him be talented, right? right? Where Lance Taylor gets the gets the credit is the fact that once he got the ball at the right place, you know, getting them there, that's what a running back coach is supposed to do. Because if the running back gets downhill too early, the holes aren't there. If he gets downhill too late, the holes are closed, right? So the footwork, the timing, that's important stuff. You know, emphasizing the stiff arm, that is something Lance Taylor and they works worked on. they worked the stiff arm. And, and, I mean, and it drove me nuts under Autry Denson that every running back always carried the ball, like, in his right arm, no matter where they were. And I've always said that's ridiculous. Get the ball in your outside arm. Because if you get the ball in the outside arm, you have a stiff arm. We've seen Notre Dame running backs this year, stiff arm and dudes left and right. Yeah. And it's it's been Kyron, it's been Logan, it's been Tyree. Tyler Buckner, it, too. I mean, he and, yes, and, and, yes. and the running and, they, and the, the quarterback. They have a helmet the on a stick. Coach. Yeah. Yeah. They, they put a tweet out, and Vince, you've seen this in practice. Yes. I've seen this in practice. They have helmet on a stick that Lance Taylor will hold as they're running through drills and they got to work on stiff arming. That's great coaching, right? Yes. Absolutely. You know, so yes, there are certain things that I don't give Lance Taylor credit for. And he and that's with any coach. I mean, when when a guy does what coach Kyron Williams did on that 91 yard touchdown run, the coach isn't necessarily getting credit for that. Credit for that. It's all the other things that you notice that are like, wow, he's doing a great job coaching. It's that they don't they don't make assignment mistakes a lot. They're on their track. They they know who to pick up and blitz pro and things like that. You know, it, it's 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 look, man, he did a great job being able to coach those guys up and get them ready to play. You know, you yeah. can even give Dell Alexander some credit for, you know, for Lorenzo Styles and Deion Colsey playing well. But instead, you're still trying to feed us this narrative of oh, we were always young and and to to justify how bad you played at the beginning of the year. And and so to me, you talk about, you know, your team's trying to build, you know, co- continuity on the offensive line. That's because you chose to play a six year senior who's not very good over a freshman and a junior and John Dirksen that spent the whole spring working with the rest of the offensive line. That was your choice. That was your decision. That was, that's not a player thing. That's a, your, that's a you thing. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And, and so th- those things, but to Nicholas, to your point, yeah, that's kind of what we're saying. Yeah. That's why we brought up the job that Chris O'Leary's done. When you think about what he started with and what he's working with now as a 26, 27 year old assistant coach who'd never been a division, Dude. who'd never coached above the D2 level yep, as a full time coach, that's a heck of a job. 
That's assistant coach of the year. That's a type heck stuff, of a man. job, serious. right? Yeah, no question. And, and so, I mean, that's the, that's the conversation we should be having. And to a degree, he did some of that today. But when he takes it back to that narrative of, oh, we always knew we were young. We had a plan to get these guys ready. You're actually taking away from the job that you guys are doing. You know, me. you want to talk about, well, we're a young offensive line. No, you're not. You want to praise Jeff Quinn. Talk about the fact that Jeff Quinn's had to put four left tackles on the field this year. Right? Two of them were true freshmen. One was a red shirt, and, and the other two were red shirt freshmen. And injuries kept forcing me to put a different guy out there. And we had to maneuver that. Like, focus on that. Don't try to right. tell me that you're young everywhere else. And, and that's where his narratives – and it's always been true of Brian Kelly. His narratives always come back to take away from the real story, which is a great one. It's a And good one that story. you should be selling on the recruiting trail of, hey, look, Man. we've been thrust into this situation where we have to play all these young yes. guys. It's we didn't plan story. to play all these young guys. That's why we didn't play them early in the year. And now that we're in there, they're balling out. That's right. a great sales pitch and on our offense trail. Is better than it was in the first right. half. Because, and you know, this is all why people, people get mad. And first of all, if you just want Homer takes, there's places where you're going to get that, right? If you want somebody to be negative all the time, there's places where you're going to get that. We're going to try to be objective. And here's the whole point. This is why this matters. And this is what would I just said. Because when you create false narratives, those false narratives are harder to sell to people that actually want to be give, be given the truth. Fans, some fans don't want the truth. They just want us to say, hey, this is the best coaching staff in the world. They're phenomenal. They make no mistakes. They're winning in spite of the talent, right. which is the narrative that's being spun in some places, right? Yeah. And, and and that does not move the needle with an 18, 17, 16-year-old who's trying to decide. So, you know, so basically if I go there, the coaches are going to get all the credit and I'm not going to get any. Or in the case of you know, th this narrative of, oh, we're really young. So wait a minute. So if I'm a junior or senior and I haven't played a lot, I'm going to be considered. I mean, there's all these negative types of narratives as opposed to the real story, which is they have had a lot of injuries this season that have thrust them into situations where they've had to play younger guys and Correct. they they got those younger guys ready to play. And yes. that should be the narrative. Hey, we started off as a veteran team. We had a lot of seniors on our, in our lineup. And now we are genuinely a young football team. Yes. I mean, we genuinely a young football we team. We weren't prepared to, th to play these guys. But no. our, my coaching staff has done an amazing job yes. getting those guys ready. Yes. To be the next man in. And I'm It just says a lot about our and, coaching staff. And, yeah, and it's, it's a so, great sales pitch. It's so easy. I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. I, yeah. It just... <sighs> we got a super chat down here. Uh, okay. Corey, because there's another football game I want to get to. Okay. Uh, Corey D with a super chat. I would love to see Riley or Barnes replacing Lewis during the offseason to corner. Lewis would make a good safety. Any word on this happening? It's too early for that, other than what we've said, which is the staff is going to be taking a look at that in the offseason. They may not end up going that route, but I'm co I'm confident that the staff is going to consider a lot of different options at corner. Yeah, and it's safety clear that they're open. Season. They're open to yeah. options because yeah. they're doing it mid season. Yeah. Um, which I if they weren't open to that, they would not have looked at Ramon Henderson and moving him to say, Agree, it would have been say, Hey, look, get DJ and Houston and KJ, and this is what this is our guys. Let's get the freshman ready. It's like, Hey, you know what? Mate, you know, Ramon's too athletic to not be playing better. Yeah, let's give him a shot over here and, right. and see what he's going to do. So, I don't think that they're, they're they're thinking about that right now. I think they thought about it during the season and they decided Clarence best helps us in 2021 at corner. They'll readdress that in the offseason, and they may still decide Clarence helps us best right now at corner. It just depends on how some other guys do and yeah. who stays and all those kind of things. Absolutely. So, you know, to me, that's kind of how, uh, you know, that that that's kind of where 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 it, it gets down to. So, yeah, it's a little bit frustrating. And I'm going to address a question here, Vince, uh, about there's somebody I don't somebody I've never seen before. Yeah, uh, like jumping on the 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 Jeff Quinn, yeah, yep, 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 bandwagon. So we'll get on. It that. was an but original. I, the original question was about Kane Madden, and uh -huh. another service talked about how bad he was. Yes, uh, how so bad he, he says is Kane Madden as horrible as Mike go. Goolsby says. So go. I've had some conversations with Mike Goolsby off the record. I like Mike. I, I've never watched a single show he's done. I like Mike. Um, uh, personally, I've had some real good. He's he's come to me and kind of push back on things I've said. And we've had some good football conversations. I, I like Mike. Uh, I don't know what he said about Caden Madden, but if he says that he wasn't good, then we would, I, I can't say that I agree with Mike because I don't know what Mike said. 
if the summary of what he said was Kane Mad's not very good, then yes, I agree with Mike. Right. Uh, so, so I, I, but I can't, I don't, I, I get nervous about responding to something that someone said if I don't have a direct quote or if I didn't hear it. So I, I can't, I can't say that. And, and then Andrew said, and adding on to the offensive line was fantastic last year. What's happened? Just guys graduating and poor recruiting 2017 to 19. I, I don't, I, I mean, okay. So it's the guy that recruited most of those years was the guy that's there now. Uh, the 2017 recruiting class had Robert Hainsey, Aaron Banks, and Josh Lug. I don't, I don't think we can blame that on recruiting. To me, it, it you know it's talked about. There's been a lot of fantastic years. I, I would say I would encourage you to kind of read some of the things we've put on the Irish Breakdown message board about that. Uh, that we, we we addressed a while here. I don't really care to get into that, but I don't think the offensive lines were that good in 2018. He he did he he was a walk on. He was a walk on at Marshall. Right. And, 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 you know, I, 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 I can't really say that, like, that sounds, that sounds disrespectful. Like, I don't like that term. And you know who, you know who called me out on that? Quentin Nelson. True story. I said something about Zeke Carell and I meant it as a compliment. I said something on, on Twitter about, I thought Zeke Carell looked like a walk on but he was playing like really well. And I was trying to compliment how well he was playing for a smaller guy. And Q DM to me and was like, that's a disrespect. He's like, you know, I expect better from you. That's a dis." And he called me out on it. Right. It's a disrespectful comment. He's this just when Q walk- was in the NFL, right? No, yes. This is, yeah. he had left Notre Dame. Yeah. And, 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 and cause it was, I think it was during Zeke's freshman or sophomore year, like freshman year. And he was like, I expect better from you. And those walk-ons work their butts off. And I was like, you know, I didn't mean it like that, which he understood. But I, it, it kind of hit me like, you know, he's kind of right. Like, it's like you use walk on as a pejorative. Correct. And so I'm, I'm hesitant to do that. But I, I understand the point that Mike is making. It's he a doesn't great story, look, by the way. Like, oh, it was, it was awesome. It's a great story. And it, it doesn't, he doesn't look like a, a guy you'd think would be recruited and on scholarship at Notre Dame. Agreed. And, and, and that's why he wasn't. And, and that was kind of things we had said this summer about it. It, it, it it's, he's not, you know, that's why I said I would have rather seen them develop Dirks and develop. Yeah, he doesn't Rocco. fit the physical prototype of what Notre Dame generally recruits and what Is they run fair? and what yeah. they run yes. and the things they run. And and I hate coming down on the kid because everything I've heard about him is he works his butt off and all that. And he's, you know, seems like a great kid and all that. He's just not a good football player. So, you know, the, 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 and I don't think they were a real well coached offensive line in 2018. And, and we've talked about the reason that that started being well is when a, current player started taking over the film sessions with the, the, the team. So I, I just, this, the things that we're seeing this year have been an issue for a while. They just don't have as much talent as they had last year to mask it. And now you don't have Chris Watt and Harry Eastan coaching up those kids. Cause Harry Eastan was always involved with the players he recruited. He right. made a commitment to them. And even though he left once he got out of the NFL, you know, he, he, he stuck to his commitment. So uh, that was part of it too. Here's the last one, Vince, Texas, Kansas. Look, Steve Sarkeesian is not in trouble getting fired. But do you think he can recover from this? Well, somebody in the chat said something along the lines of in the post-game press conference. He said, I I don't think some of the players are listening to me or something along those no, lines. No, hap- they asked him, do you think the players have stopped listening to you? Okay. He said, you'd have to ask them that. Oh, okay. All right, and that's people are making as... that. I actually think that was a smart thing to say. Yeah, that's actually not as bad as what I, yeah. I, I, yeah. what I gleaned uh, yeah. off of that. He, but... he basically, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Look, <laughs> I know it's your first year. I know that you are changing things and you're you're in, you know, putting in all your stuff and your culture and you're this and you're that. And so, you know, depending on what happens next year, I think it could potentially be explained away. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, this is a tough hill to climb because mm-hmm. you're going to have to deal with this during the off season. And you're going to have to deal with it on the recruiting trail because why would anybody that's recruiting against Texas not use that to their advantage? You know what I mean? Like it's, it does, it certainly doesn't help you in any way. And so it's going to be tough to overcome plain Mm -hmm. and simple, plain and simple. So could he, yeah, he could, they can go out there and win 10 games next year. And then everybody's going to be talking about, they're going to forget about, you know, them losing to, to Kansas. They will. Um, But it's still going to be tough to overcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And and Joseph Salvatore said this. It, 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 I've heard that Sark's Alabama ways of coming to the Texas program and the players there don't like it. Those are Herman's guys. He'll be fine, but needs to create his own culture there. But see, this is the problem, Joseph. I agree with you completely, but here's the problem. At a place like Texas with boosters that expect you to, to look like Alabama right away, the, the concern, and when I talk about not recovering from it, does the, does the culture become so toxic from an outside standpoint that you're never given the opportunity because you start hearing these rumblings about how they don't want them and this, this you know, coming from the boosters, meaning the school doesn't support him, the, the decision makers don't support him, so he loses his authority and power. That's my concern because if I'm Steve Sarkeesian, I'm taking – I'm taking because there's no – I don't think there's a limit on how many transfers you can take, right? I'm transfer so. pulling the heck out of my roster because yeah. you – because here's what happened. Mike Norvell did not do enough of that his first two years. And because they're still in, in, I thought it'd be better this year, but there's still too many of those guys around. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to cut bait. You've got to sign as many dudes as you can legally sign in this upcoming recruiting class. Even if some of them are three star kids that, you know, and I'm using the word three star like literally, like these kids are are actually three star players, Mm -hmm. but they're try hard kids that can play special teams. They're going to bring the right culture and mentality. And you got to counter them with, the other guys. And and to me, that is something that they're going to have to do because I'm concerned that if they don't give him time to change, because the, the hardest thing to do as a football coach, it's not to do what Charlie Weiss did, which is you have a good culture. You have good kids that have been coached. You just got to steer them in the right direction. Right. You is stepping into a toxic culture. Brian Kelly stepped into a toxic culture when he replaced Charlie Weiss. I don't think Charlie Weiss stepped into a toxic culture with Ty. Ty was a bad football coach. I don't think Ty created a toxic culture. I agree I think with the that. players respected Ty. No, I agree with he that. He just was a Absolutely. bad coach. Yeah. So Charlie stepped into a different situation. Charlie's uh, left a toxic culture because of the coaches he hired. Tanuta, Corwin Brown. I mean, there was a lot of crazy stuff that went on under Ty, under Charlie's tenure. He has Brian Polian on staff, and he's constantly demeaning him and undermining him in front of the play. I mean, there was so much stuff going on under Ty or under Charlie that Brian Kelly inherited a toxic culture. And that's why I defended Brian Kelly when he said, my guys versus Charlie guys. I understood what he was saying, and he was spot on. Mm -hmm. Right now, a lot of people in the media spun that into an anti-Brian Kelly thing, which I remember when I got home and started hearing about how people responded to it, I was a little surprised that, 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 that people were spinning it that way. But... That the problem is, uh, her, he's stepping into a toxic situation, Vince, and I don't know if they're going to give him t- time to change it. Because in order to change it, you've got to get—I ri- mean, just completely get rid of a bunch of dudes, and hopefully get a bunch of transfers. And you know, you need to spread the word to every high school coach in the country. If you have a Texas kid that is somewhere else, and he's a hard worker, and he's this, and he's out, you tell him we're open for business. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what you got to do. Because until the culture changes, because there's a lot of soft dudes at Texas. And you want to know why Texas keeps losing games and losing games late? They have a soft culture. And it is a toxic culture. And until he can just com- – he's got to completely overhaul that whole thing, man. He And he's got to say, look, you're a senior. I'm bringing in this freshman. I'm just telling you right now, he's starting over you. Because you you mm-hmm. know that, hey, you're not working. You're not – you got a crappy attitude. You're not starting next year. Now, you can stay – but you're not you're not starting for me next year. And what's that guy going to do? He's going to leave. Right. Fine. Which is what you Good. want him to do anyway. It's what you want him to do. Yeah, exactly. And he's going to have to do that. And right. and that may mean he's short on numbers for a year or two. That's okay. Recruit your type of kids. Bring in grad right. transfers or no more transfers going to fit what you want to do. You know what I mean? And uh, look, man. And look, you don't think Nick Saban's going to try to say, hey, look, you know, I got this backup kid who's not going to play. I'd like to free it up for this five-star recruit. Why don't you go play over at Texas? You yeah. know what I mean? Come on in. That's right. Here's That's the right. Here, yeah. Here's the burnt orange carpet on the way in. Yeah, come yeah. on in. Yeah, it's a it's a rough spot. Do you are, do you got to take offense or you got time for a little bit more? Yeah, I, the bell's gonna ring here in a second. But somebody asked if uh, Jack Cohn has another year of eligibility. He does I not. So I have I have no. We've yeah. talked about this before. Yeah, it's been a while. Right. I asked someone at Notre Dame. I finally got someone at Notre Dame to give me point blank range uh, answer, <laughs> and they said no. So okay. Jack Cohn played three years at Wisconsin. Last year he did not play what would have been a senior year. He had a he so basically he could have got a medical to play this year. Right. You can't take a medical and a COVID year in the same year. You can only get one. So like that one year of COVID and medical does not count as two extra years. Interesting. That's where the so like had he redshirted as a sophomore, right, and then had the COVID year, 
this year would have been his medical, and then next year could have been his COVID. But his medical and his COVID both happened the same year because he did not redshirt as a freshman. He played five games as a true freshman. So that's gotcha. why that's why uh, Jack Cohn is not eligible to return next year. Like it can't. There's no appeal. There's no nothing. He's played his four years. He's got his medical and all that in the same year. He can't come back. That's what we were told flat out from people in Notre Dame. And so it, that now that's been something that's been a back and forth. And that's the whole uncertainty of this whole COVID thing. The whole COVID eligibility thing has kind of been a little screwy. Not everybody yeah. understands it. Right. So I think there was some, some uncertainty at first with some that thought he he could maybe have an extra year. But you can't do, you can't get two right. years out of one. Is basically right. how it goes. And and I believe the there was this year there was uh you could have more than eighty five scholarships, and I believe right. that goes back to eighty five correct for next year. Now there season. is some talk that they may slowly work that back. Okay, as opposed but I don't to think just... the NCA is gonna end up doing that. Okay. Because there's a lot of schools that don't want that because they can't afford the five extra. I mean, there's a lot of lower right. level schools, not power five schools, but there's a lot of lower level schools that are still financially struggling because what happened is a lot of colleges were living outside their means oh yeah they were spending more than they were and they were relying on you know all these different things and you know for sports to to survive and then when sports gets taken away and revenue gets taken away from sports you're, you're living outside your means because what's yes. happening for all these academics who don't like athletics the reality is your 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 salary is because of the football team. Oh, no question because if like if these schools had to pay based off what the school was making They'd have to be charging so much money to get these kids into school. It's right. the athletics programs of these places that allow you to have the things that you have in a lot of instances. No question. And so when that when that sports money went away, people realized, wow, uh, that's pretty important to our to our bottom line. Right. And so a lot of schools can't afford to pay for five, ten extra kids. And and so that makes it a little bit unique, but it, it's it's going to see how some of these teams are going to go from super veteran this year to super, super young. young. Next year. <laughs> it's going like to be Toledo really, for that Matt yeah. for that turn as an example. It's got like a lot of yeah. six, fifth and six year guys, right? So it's going to be really interesting to see how that stuff plays oh, out. So. Now I got to go to class. So, so All that's right. it, man. So we'll everybody we'll maybe, we may chat a little bit more about this that tomorrow, but a uh, lot of lot of wild games this weekend. We'll definitely have we'll have our, our show tomorrow night tomorrow Tuesday or tomorrow Tuesday twelve thirty we'll have our normal uh, preview of Notre Dame's offense against Georgia Tech's defense and then tomorrow night we will have a our, our about twenty minutes after the start of the college football playoff rankings we will be on explaining where Notre Dame is and give our thoughts on that and then a reminder that Wednesday we are doing a there you go right there we're doing a Thanksgiving drive so essentially what we're doing on Thursday is. Uh, any any super chat you give now we'll talk football during Wednesday right it'll be our normal mailbag but we're going to ask for super chats and and then we're also my wife is in the process we we I'm pretty confident we're going to have this up if you either want to give anonymous anonymously or you don't want to leave a super chat because you want all the money to go you can do that and we'll have it we'll have a, a link for that where you a page for that where you can just donate either PayPal or Venmo or a credit card uh, I, what I don't know is if we're going to be able to provide you tax information for it to be a write-off. It may just be, Hey, I'm just, I'm just given to give. Right. But all the money that we raise on the donations, all the money that we raise on super chats is going to go towards, we're going to go. I've already talked to several shelters and charities that have specific food needs, like a local charity that we're going to be working with. Uh, they have, they need turkeys because turkeys are so much more expensive this year. It's harder for them to go out there and they only had like one, and they need a lot more. So we've already told them, hey, we're going to buy some turkeys for you. Don't worry about it. We're going to take care of it. Uh, so we're going to raise money. And so we're going to take the money we get. We're going to take a shot of it and show everyone on Twitter and on our message board the, the number that you that Google tells us we made. We're going to take the number. I'll be able to look at my account. We'll take photos of it because it's going to all be about transparency. Vince and I are going to go do some Thanksgiving shopping. Uh, we're going to buy all the the the, the all the, the stuff that they need. We're going to buy all the food that they need. And if we raise more than than we need, then what we're going to do, too, is some of the shelters have said, hey, if you're able to, if you have money left over, we could use clothes. We could use socks. We could use, you know, gloves, hats, because we're getting into the cold season. And those are always the big, even more than food, a lot of times is, you know, for ho the homeless community is, you know, hats, gloves, sweatshirts, pants, socks, underwear, all that kind of stuff. So we'll buy the food that they need. We want to make sure that we're we're not just buying stuff to stick on the stores. That's what they're saying. They they have food needs, but once we've met those food needs, if we have money left over, 
then you know they would like us to be able to buy some other things that they need. So we're gonna we're gonna do that as best we can. And uh, I'm excited about it. it's gonna be a lot of fun. Like I said, we've been very blessed at Irish Breakdown in the last year. Uh, we've been blessed with a platform to have fun and raise money and make money and pay our bills. And it's our turn to use that platform to help others. And that's what we want to do. So we're going to help the Elkhart community. We're going to help the South Bend community. We're going to help as many as we can. So that's what we're doing on um, on, on Wednesday. And uh, Matt D said, Y'all, you, you should have Angela film you and Vince shopping and delivering it and post it on YouTube, fun videos. We may do something like that, Matt. The reason that I'm hesitant to do that is because I feel like that sort of looks like we're a look at us. Hey, look at us. Look at this great thing we're doing. Uh, when you deliver it and, you know, it just it just seems to me kind of like a promotion, self-promotion. And that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people. We have to promote the event. Otherwise, people won't know what we're doing. But we'll see. We'll see about that. I, I want to take photos of the fact that show like here's the receipt that shows we spent the money. Right. And And that's something that I'm willing to do. But, uh, you know, I don't want to make the shopping and the other things sort of a a, a show because then it kind of, you know, kind of looks like it's it's being done for the wrong reasons. So that's just my concern. So anyway, uh, that's what we're going to be doing. So that'll be Wednesday. But again, we'll be talking football. We're going to talk football, but it's about you giving super chats and helping us out and donating. And then we'll talk football from that. and. Um, It'll be a lot of fun. So that's going to be this Wednesday, November 17th is when we will do that. So I look forward to everybody being on there. And before you leave, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell if you have not already done so. And if you're listening via podcast, give us a five-star review. Sign up for the message boards. We've had a great couple weeks of signups, a lot of good conversation, and uh, want to get more people involved. And uh, we're going to have I'm, – I'm hoping my wife's finishing it up now, but I'm hoping to post – the job proposal for the new recruiting person. I'm hoping to get that started here real soon because I want to have somebody on. Uh, I'd like to have somebody hired by January 1st. We'll see if we can do something sooner or later. I want to make sure it's the right hire, not just to get somebody. But we got to get that out. So hopefully that'll come up too. So a lot going on this week. It's going to be a real fun, busy week. Of course, Thanksgiving's next week. So got a lot going on. But I hope to see all of you around. Uh, so Vince is gone. Before Vince, I'm Brian. Have a great rest of your day. And we will talk to you again tomorrow.